Hello, this is lecture 20 in our lecture series and today we are continuing um, the path quantization of a fermionic field. Okay, so last time we took a look at how the uh, fermionic harmonic oscillator looks like and these are the results we got. So we were able to rewrite the partition function in, in the, the functional generator in the case of field theories in this way. Mind you, still we only have time here. So we are in zero plus one dimension. Right, so this is basically the harmonic oscillator. And we found the inverse of this operator, which is uh, the Feynman propagator still in zero plus one dimension. And what we want to do today is actually take this into four dimensional space, right? Uh, eventually even Minkowski space. But we'll do that in the Euclidean space first, because we know it's uh, less dangerous to do it that way. Uh, and so the first thing we want to do is to go to Euclidean, still in zero, zero plus one dimensions. Then to add three more Euclidean dimensions won't be that hard. Uh, the one thing we could notice uh, this far, and I just want to recall that, we, we talked about this in the end of the last video, is that now our Feynman propagators is already different from what we had in the scalar the, the, or the bosonic uh, harmonic oscillator right? or in the scalar field. You see there's only one pole here in my Feynman propagator. That means that I, 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 uh, depending on closing this integral on the upper imaginary plane or in the uh, lower imaginary plane, this function will be zero because I can uh, just, in one of those options, I don't get the pole. And that makes the propagator asymmetrical. Now I, 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 I cannot just exchange these two coordinates. For now, they are just time. But you see that this propagates to form dimensions. I have to be careful because my propagator is not symmetric under exchange of these coordinates. Okay? So let's start taking this to the Euclidean space. So I, I want to rotate this to make a Vic rotation which is just taking my time to minus i t e. My functional generator was previously writing, uh, written explicitly as, it, before I even do this uh, expression, right, I could have written it more explicitly as uh, deep psi bar, deep psi exponential. of i integral in time of psi bar i del t minus omega psi plus psi bar eta plus eta bar psi and this is uh, where I make this rotation and it becomes, uh, let's call this Z Euclidean, right? This uh, just repeat, even the exponential. Yeah. Now this D I D T becomes just D T E. Uh, absorb the I psi bar Euclidean. This guy becomes just del time Euclidean. Omega does not change. Psi Euclidean plus psi bar Euclidean, eta Euclidean plus, right? And in these functions, I'm in all of them making the same thing I did before. So I changed the argument of the function and renamed the whole function with this new argument, just psi e, right? To say Euclidean. And of course, if I go from this expression to this one in Minkowski, I can do the same in the Euclidean and get, of course, the integral here is also on the Euclidean fields. Right? 
I can get well in this step I actually do the integral so these uh, path integrals are hidden in here right? Euclidean exponential of ds d tau eta bar s Euclidean these guys are also Euclidean times uh, d of s tau eta Euclidean of tau and of course I'll suppress the Euclidean from now on right otherwise it's too many indexes to be carrying around now you know I am in Euclidean time right and in this case I can baptize this as my action right this one right here as my action so my minus my Euclidean action will be just minus psi bar d minus 1 psi plus psi bar eta plus eta bar psi and my propagator right, is now the inverse of this operator which is just del t plus omega see it's the same sign and I, I brought this sign outside right here and uh, this is just e the e Euclidean right 2 pi exponential of minus i e s minus sigma tau actually what sigma s minus tau e plus i omega right? so you see now I don't get the pole as expected in the Euclidean right the pole is not in my path of integration is all the way over in the uh, imaginary axis right? so if I want to rotate back to Minkowski right I have to stop short of this pole right and make this rotation take this e euclidean right here right and just exchange it for minus i plus epsilon that's to stop before i get to the pole e and if i substitute this here i get back to this propagator right not with the same epsilon but uh, i just rename epsilon that's uh that's consistent so if i want to do the euclidean propagator i i just use this lagrangian instead of that one above and that's the one we'll take uh, to four dimensions right so now i want to increase my number of dimensions right in the minkowski space that would take my lagrangian let's use m here for minkowski to this one psi bar i del slash minus m psi which is the one we have already seen that generates the uh, Dirac equation and in the Euclidean it's it's the generalization of this one right with the same sign for these two guys right which means I also have uh, different sign here but I need to be careful with that now now that I go to four dimensions in the Euclidean I have to be careful because now I have Dirac matrices here right that's one thing that appears for fermions that in zero plus one dimensions it's it's not there right now these guys become four component objects and I have uh, the gamma matrices in here and the gamma matrix have to satisfy the Clifford algebra right this 
needs to be true, but I'm changing my metric. Now I'm going to a Euclidean metric here instead of Minkowski. That means that the explicit form of my Dirac uh, matrices have changed. Right? In particular, gamma zero square. In, in our uh, representation for the Dirac matrices, this is one, and this was minus one because of the convention we use for the metric, which is plus, minus, 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 right? Now I have to define uh, some Euclidean Dirac matrices, right? I don't have to do anything with the time one because uh, it's already one. Remember, the, the Euclidean metric is just plus, 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 right? And, and so I'll call these Euclidean Dirac matrix number four it will be just the same as gamma zero that we defined before. And on the other side, I have to change the three orders, right? So I will define some gamma Euclidean for the for gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, right? Which needs to be one. And this implies that these guys will be minus i gamma i. This is a little bit strange. It seems I'm rotating the space components on on the Dirac matrices, but this is a consequence of, of having a metric which is plus, minus, 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 right? It's not the most convenient one to have if you're rotating to Euclidean space. So many books that do quantum field theory mainly in Euclidean space use the the minus plus 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 uh, metric, but it's doable, right? and this is one of the consequences, right? It's just a little bit odd, but there's nothing to it, right? It's just that I have to invert three, three uh, signs on the metric. Mm -hmm. uh, with those new gamma matrices, right? nothing changes for my psi bar, it's just psi dagger, it was by psi dagger gamma zero, will become psi dagger gamma four, right? And I'll baptize, like I, I already said before, right? Under the new Euclidean variables, psi e, I'll, I'll call this function psi e, which is just psi of minus i t e x, right? That's psi e of x e, right? It's just this function, right? And keep in mind that in this representation, now that I, I am in Euclidean space, doesn't matter uh, if the index is up or down, and all the gamma matrices are their medium. Okay, going back to the functional gen generator, right? Z, zero, because I'm in the free theory of F, is just eta bar eta integral of the psi bar e psi exponential of minus. Now I'm, I'm going to four dimensions, so there's the d4x here. Right? This sign is what you get after you absorb i's, all the factors here. Right? I have psi bar slash plus m psi. Again, I'm suppressing the Euclidean index, but everything is in Euclidean space here. And I have an integral in d4x for eta bar psi plus psi bar eta. Everything in Euclidean space. Right? Again, keep in mind that these are now four component objects. So the scalar product here that includes this integral. Also, there's an implicit sum, right? So you have to think about these guys as having an index here. So it's this, sometimes I will just indicate this in this way. And this means d for x, eta alpha of x, psi, let's say eta bar, alpha of x, psi, alpha of x. When alpha goes, where alpha goes from 1 
to 4 and have has nothing to do with the Euclidean index that is, for instance, in this del mu here, gamma mu, right? It's the spinorial index that, that gives a size to the Dirac matrices. They are 4 by 4 in this index, right? Uh, same is true for this guy, right? When I, when I write uh, my Z, S, Z, 0, 0 in the absence of sources, right? Exponential of eta bar del slash plus m minus one eta, right? That will mean, right, a double integral in d4x, d4y, because there's two scalar products here, right? Some eta bar of x with some index alpha, right? The inverse function here needs to have two indexes, alpha and beta. We also depend, will be a function of x and y. And this guy will be eta of y, beta, right? It's all summed over. So now my propagator will be a four by four matrix in this space of, of the Dirac spinners. Right, with this index of the direct spinners. Hmm? And to write that guy explicitly, let me put this in yellow because this is just a comment on how this product works. This one is what this product does. Right? Uh, and writing this guy explicitly, I'll call this the Feynman propagator. I use S for fermions for the propagator. X, Y, define this guy as the inverse of this one. And this is, uh, I'm saying that the derivative is in X or so not Y, right? And this is just I, D, 4, P, Euclidean momentum, 2, P, 4, Exponential of i p x minus y minus p slash plus i m. And you have to understand what that means. Because there's a matrix down here, right? This p slash is just gamma mu p mu. So this whole expression is, is a 4 by 4 matrix. So this division really doesn't make sense. What it really means is that that 1 over minus p slash plus i m is just the inverse of this matrix, right? That's what that ratio means. In fact, many times, instead of writing it like that, right? Like uh, one over p slash plus i m, we'll write it more explicitly as a matrix. And that can be done by writing it like that, minus i m over p squared plus m squared. Now there's no matrices here. This is just a number, right? And oh, oh, this is a four by four matrix, right? This guy has a gamma matrix and this is proportional to the four by four identity. And if I multiply this object by that one, right? I just make this product Then I have the product between these two numerators. And remember, a while ago, I proved for any uh, Lorentz vector that if I take the slash times the slash, this is just p square. And then it's, it's easy to see that these will be p square, right? From this part, all the cross terms go away, plus m square. Of course, times the one, by, the, the four by four identity divided by, by p squared and square. So I have just the identity, right? This goes away. So this is really the inverse of that. And sometimes we'll use it like that. Depends on what is convenient at the moment. Right? Many times it's more convenient to keep like that and pretend we're dividing by matrices, right? Uh, in fact, to show that this 
this is really the inverse of this operator in here uh, it's easier to keep it like that so let's apply this operator to the propagator and remember that when you do um, del slash in the in the x variable apply to i p the exponential of i p x what you're really doing is gamma mu del mu applying apply to this guy right this del mu just brings uh, power of i p mu down and you get uh, p i p slash exponential of i p x right so the del slash really brings you down a p slash right matrix matrix hmm? then it's easy to see if i apply these uh, derivatives here right i'll just get uh, this guy will become minus i p slash right and there's a power of i here i just bring that i inside and i get the same i have in the denominator so the numerator and the denominator conceal each other and you just get the exponential so this is just delta 4 of x minus y i remember the derivative x on on, on this part is acting on x so that much is clear i really have the inverted the operator i wanted to invert and i got my feynman propagator for fairness right here now i want to go back to minkowski in order to do that it's more convenient to actually write it in this way in the explicitly matricial way right uh, so let's write the euclidean propagator x y s let me copy this paste here and now i just exchange these by that explicitly that explicit matrix this one and i will use this expression to do the rotation back to minkowski okay so to do that remember i want to do it keeping p e 0 x e 0 equal to p 0 x 0 that dictates how i rotate the p is the same thing as i did uh, in the scalar right it's the same rotation so i'll call p euclidean 0 as minus e minus i p 0 and x euclidean 0 as i x 0 hmm? actually here but it doesn't matter for my metric i can go up and down right um, and that is done by using the euclidean equal to it p e 0 i cannot rotate all the way back because i want to avoid the poles in the imaginary axis so i stop at epsilon before 90 degrees of rotation right and that means this expression e, e square plus m square will go to minus p square plus m square minus i epsilon right this part is exactly the same we did for the scalar because we have the same in the denominator right? it's exactly the same the numerator is different right and and p e slash i need to be careful because i'm also changing the the gamma matrices right this is actually gamma e 
Euclidean for P E zero plus gamma E I P I and I have to use the relations I had for these guys to go back to the Minkowski space gamma matrices. I'll do that. So this guy is just gamma zero. So nothing changes there. The rotation for the uh, Euclidean energy minus I plus epsilon P zero. The rotation for these guys gives me a minus I gamma I and this does not change. It's just P I. Now I have to, to be careful with the indexes that are up or down, right? I can bring this one down. This is just a scalar product. I can write this as minus I gamma zero P zero minus I gamma vector P vector plus epsilon. I forgot the epsilon here. Oh no, the epsilon is there. Just writing it explicitly, epsilon gamma zero P zero. Hmm? So let me go back here. Again, this would be easier if I had uh, the mostly minus metric, but let's be faithful to our choice, right? So I'm saying that, uh, let me not, not do that, I just, here and I'm going to Minkowski now this is the integral I'm solving this I there in the rotation d 4 p over 2 pi to the fourth exponential of I p0 x0 minus y0 plus pi xi minus yi. Here I don't have to keep the epsilons, right? I'm not trying to avoid, for, avoid poles, so the epsilon will just sit here until I rotate back, so I don't care about the epsilon there. And I want to apply these here, so I get since there's a minus here, I have to invert every sign there. This will be I gamma zero P zero plus I gamma vector P vector minus I M. Again, I don't need the epsilon in the numerator, right? It's only on the denominator it is important. So let me put minus P square plus M square minus i epsilon, which is coming from here. As a final touch, I use the freedom in my integral here to make a change of variables and, and send p0 into minus p0. Right? That changes a sign here, but also changes the limit of integration, which I flip back and I absorb this sign. So nothing changes here stays the same. But in here I change the sign on the first term only. This is the same, which allows me to, to write uh, this exponential as a scalar product in Minkowski space. So I get a minus in front here is minus i p x minus y. Right? I can now put everything together. Same thing here, right? If I invert the sign on this First term, I can put these two together and write this as I uh, P slash plus M, right? Because there was a minus here, it's minus P slash. Right? So there was an overall minus sign that came out. And I take this overall minus sign and I put it on the denominator and change all the signs in the denominator. So it becomes P square plus I epsilon, which is uh, now very similar to the scalar one. Right? With the exception of this thing in the numerator. 
which should somehow eliminate one of the poles. Uh, we'll see. And me highlight this expression because this is the one of the main results of the day. Mm -hmm. This is the Feynman propagator for free fermions, right? We're doing free theory here, right? I hope I'm not stressing this a lot, but we took only Gaussian terms in psi. I had psi bar psi, just psi square, right? And, and so I'm putting no interaction, so whatever results I, I'm getting are all for the free theory. And I got that from the canonical formalism, and now I'm getting, in fact, the canonical formalism, I left that as an exercise, and now I'm getting this propagator in the uh, path integral formalism. Right? So we already have one of the Feynman rules of the theory of fermions, which is the propagator. Well, now that we have the propagators, the next step would be to uh, look at how uh, you use these propagators to connect points, uh, external points and, 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 and vertexes in, in our theory, right? In other words, uh, we need to see how the Wick theorem works for fermions, right? We already know that we have made changes both to the normal ordering and the time ordering, Right? Now there's a sign that appears when I reorder fields. Uh, and of course, that will lead to changes in, uh, in the Wick theorem, of course. All right? We could do that on the canonical formalism, but we'll do that on, on, on the um, functional formalism because I think that's, that's much easier. I mean, more direct at the very least. If you remember well, the way you, we actually got general uh, Feynman rules for for scalars was using an expression for the functional generator. Uh, here I'm talking still about the bosonic case in the presence of a source by writing this uh, in this way. We took the exponential of the interaction. If you don't remember this, this is in page 100, 110 of our uh, lecture notes. Right? But I, I, I would write the exponential of the interacting part of the theory, say this is the potential, but instead of having the fields here, I had derivatives in the sources. And that acting on the exponential of half of j delta j, which is the, the func uh, generating functional for the free theory, right? would uh, give me the full functional generator. And then, using uh, generalization of the uh, Coleman uh, lemma, I rewrote this by exchanging these j's uh, by derivatives and writing this expression. Del delta phi. Now phi here is phi classical, right? Because in the end, I'll take that to zero. Del delta phi acting on the exponential of minus d for x of v phi. So the interaction is all here, right? Times this exponential of the sources. And then I take sources and classical fields to zero hmm? on these expressions here. So that gave me the the generating functional and using that i could quickly show that essentially you can get the feynman rules straight from the interacting part of the lagrangian just just by differentiating on the fields right now i want to do the same for fermions i want to generalize this expression for fermions right the first thing to notice let's try to write this first expression uh, let's start with that Right? So now I want a z of eta bar eta. And let's just take an extra leap and assuming I also have uh, scalars. So now I'm looking for a theory that involves both uh, fermions and scalars. 
I already know for the scalars I can use a source, right? And for the fermions, I need two sources for every fermion, right? And, and that means that the analogous of that expression, right, is the exponential of the interacting part of the action, right? But I will exchange the fields, right? I have an action. If I'm saying that my theory has one fermion and one scalar, my uh, interaction will depend on psi bar, psi for the fermion, right? It's a charge fermion, right? And phi, which is the scalar. That means that in here, I have to exchange these guys for derivatives, right? And the one change that is not trivial is this one, this minus sign right here. Let me just write the whole expression. Del del eta. Here I have eta bar and del del j. And that will be acting on the free uh, part of the generating functional, right? So these are just the Gaussian part of the path integrals. And that's what this zero in the top here means. F here means fermion, here is for the scalar. And this depends on J. So that's the generalization of this. And the only known trivial part is this one. Because remember, the reason I can exchange the fields for derivatives is because these are path integrals and these derivatives go inside the path integral and act on something like that, right? Which brings down a field. So I can substitute this part by, by fields and then resum everything. Right? But in the case of the derivatives on eta, remember that the sources for fermions looked like eta bar psi was the exponential of eta bar psi plus psi bar eta, right? So in the case where I'm differentiating in relation to eta bar, there's no, no subtlety. Right? If I act with a derivative here, this is just psi. But if I want to differentiate on eta and not eta bar, right? If I want to differentiate on this guy, this is not just psi bar, because remember, for Grassmann derivatives on Grassmann numbers, if I come here and I want to act on this guy, I have to go over this, which is another Grassmann number, and I get a minus sign. And that's why I put minus the derivative there. So for the guys that are uh, the sources to the right of the field, instead of exchanging the field by the derivative, I have to exchange the field by minus the derivative. Right? That's the price you, you pay for working with Grassmann numbers. You have to be very careful with orders and signs that accompany these orders, right? So essentially I have to be careful with that, but other than that is fine. So I exchange psi by minus del del a, eta and psi bar, um, psi is del del eta bar, but psi bar is minus del del eta. The same kind of care now needs to be applied when I try to get the Coleman lemma, right? This, this part here. Thinking only of the fermionic side, right? It will look like this. So, uh, say any function of these derivatives, del del eta and del del eta bar, acting on z of eta bar eta, will now be replaced. I want to exchange who is written in terms of derivatives and who is written in terms of the fields, right? I'll have to write a z that now gets a minus del del psi here instead of del del psi. And del del psi bar, right? And this will be applied on f of psi bar psi times the exponential, right, the same function I had here, times the exponential of psi bar eta plus eta bar psi. And now psi is psi classical, right? So in the end, I, I, I make it zero, right? 
And again, same reason I get the sign. Psi is to the right of another Grassmann number here. So instead of just differentiating Psi, I, I need this sign to compensate for that. Right? And, and that means that if I use this uh, new version of Coleman Lemma for the fermionic part up here, I can rewrite this guy. Right? As, remember, this guy is just, let me copy this and write explicitly the free part is just eta bar Feynman propagator eta, right? Which we, we have shown this before, right? Which means I can use this expression to rewrite this as uh, the exponential of minus del, del psi, right? Exchanging at the bar by minus del del psi, s f del del psi, and pay attention. I have I have scalar products here which carry integrals in in, in space time. They they also means uh, products uh, between these matrices, right? All these guys have index spinor indexes that go from one to four, and those are also uh, implied here, right? And and that I take this part of the exponential. Since I'm doing that for the fermionic part, this will be just the exponential of the interaction, the, the interacting action, right? And I put psi bar psi here. Since I'm doing nothing with the scalar part, right? It's still del del j here and I have now these right psi bar eta again integrals implied uh, contraction of the spinor indexes are implied here eta bar psi right? and that's acting on this guy which I didn't do anything with yet Right? This is just part of this f function that goes from one side to the other. Right? That's a multiplicative factor in terms of the Coleman lemma for fermions. Right? But then I can apply the Coleman lemma for scalars. And finally, write the, the expression that I, I really need, which is now this part is just sitting there. I'll do this guy, which is. This is just the exponential of half of j delta j. Right? Now will become the exponential of half of del del phi delta del del phi. So I can, here I have the Feynman propagator for the scalar, Feynman propagator for the fermion. Right? And this is all acting on the exponential of minus the interacting action of psi bar psi phi, which I can read straight from the Lagrangian, right? Plus a bunch of source terms. Psi, psi, psi bar, phi will be zero at the end, right? This is a very important expression. There's a few things you can already notice. The most important of them is that if I, I, I turn off the interactions, the two theories factor from each other, right? I can get the, the even if there are interacting terms that only involve phi and some other interacting terms that only involve psi, if there's no product here between the the scalars and fermions, then I can factor this theory into, right? And have the, the Feynman rules for the scalar separately from the Feynman rules for the fermion, 
right? So, and that means that the propagator for the scalar that we already know, if I put a lambda phi four interaction here too, that only involves the scalar, all those Feynman rules still apply, okay? Because I can easily factor one from another here. Of course, that's not what we are interesting, interested in. What we want to see is really an interaction that involves fermions and scalar, right? Because that's the simplest interaction that involves fermions, right? It's called the Yukawa interaction. That's what we see next. Just looking at this expression, you can already see Vick's theorem over here, right? Because we know these derivatives for the scalars will act on every point here, external or internal, right? And start to connect them, right? They'll have extra derivatives for external points because if I want a green function out of this, I'll have to make derivatives on the external points. And these derivatives together with the ones coming from the external points will connect all the points uh, with propagators. The same will happen for the fermions. And since these are Grassmann numbers, it's easy to see that they'll start connecting uh, these guys, but will generate signs. When I try to get to the field I want to differentiate in, I'll get signs. In fact, I'm missing a psi bar here. Let me find where I, did I miss the psi bar? Is here. There should be a bar here and a bar here. Right? So that's what will happen, right? These psi bars will go there, try to connect these fields, and that's the theorem, basically just the product rule of this derivative. It's easier to uh, turn that into Feynman rules taking a specific case, right? And the specific case we'll take is the Yukawa interaction. The Yukawa interaction is given by these interacting Lagrangian. So G is some coupling, gives you the strength of the interaction, just a number, right? And then I have the product of psi bar, psi, and phi. So you cannot go much simpler than that with fermions. You could, you could uh, easily, you can easily see that if I want to only use fermions, since this is an invariant, I would have to at least put two more. And that's already a more complicated interaction than this one. Right? So that's the simplest you can go. And it was a historically very important interaction, right? It was proposed by Yukawa, right? To explain the nuclear force. So in, in the original context, these, these fermions were the proton and the neutron, right? These, the, the fermions here were protons or neutrons, nucleons, right? And this guy was called the meson. And later in history, it turned out to be the pion, right? So these, these, uh, Theory, you can derive a potential for this, the Yukawa potential, and, and that's a pretty good potential to explain uh, nuclear interaction, right? Later, you appeared in, in many other contexts. Nowadays, also very important because this is also the interaction between the Higgs, the scalar, right? Is the Higgs and the fermions of the standard model have also exactly this interaction. So it is a very, now, now we're going for, from lambda phi four, which is more of a toy model, to a theory that explain a lot of physical phenomena, right? This is really an uh, important one, right? Uh, so let's, let's look at the Feynman rules for this. So I want to substitute this over here. Let's suppose that's the only interaction we have in our theory. I could have others, but uh, no point in complicating it, right? and rewrite this one in terms of these directions. So I come here, notice I am in the Euclidean uh, uh, metric here because there's no I in front of this interaction. Psi bar, psi phi, right? And I want to get my Feynman rules for that, right? Let's start with a, a two-point uh, green functions, right? For the free theory at first, just to, sh to, to nail down the point I just made about how fermions and scalars 
uh, factorize. Right? So now my green functions, just to define notation, will be specified by a bunch of numbers. So I'll put the order in G. Right? So my parameter of perturbative expansion now is G, just like lambda was important before. So N means I'm calculating this G to the power N, right? And down here, I have to indicate the external number of external points, right? Which I'll uh, characterize by two numbers, right? Where, so let me write this explicitly. So this is the order of perturbation. M will be the number of bosons in external legs. So I, I, I need to know how many bosons I have in my external legs, right? And N will represent the number of fermions. Right? And, and mind you, I have just one kind of fermion and one kind of boson here. Right? So they are all, if I put 10 fermions in, in the final states, they are all 10 identical fermions, just to simplify. Right? So the very first thing I can, I can calculate from this is the free theory, right? two-point function for fermions. Right? So now I have two uh, fermionic legs going out, right? which we already defined before as psi of x, psi bar of y. Right? Since I am in the Euclidean space, there's no uh, time ordering here. And remember, I, I'll try to keep track of this, these indexes because you, you need to be careful with them. I will use alpha and beta for the, the spinner indexes. That means I have to take two derivatives uh, of z, one in relation to eta bar of x, say, I'll just take this. This is a function of two points, which I'm, I'm naming x and y. Right? So eta bar of x and minus del, del eta, of y, right? And I'll carry these indexes, right? So for psi, I have del del eta bar, and for psi bar, I have minus del del eta of y, right? Sometimes I can, I can survive without carrying these indexes just by writing them once and noticing that x will be always, always paired with alpha and y will be always paired with beta. And this is applied to the free theory because I'm calculating these at zero order, eta bar, eta j, right? And in the end, I make eta bar equal eta equal j equal zero. Notice that uh, it's trivial just looking at these derivatives to see that these other possible two-point function, or even this one that involves two psi bars, right, are zero, because then I would have two derivatives in eta or two derivatives in eta bar, and inside this generating functional, what I have is this exponential here, right, which applied here will give me uh, eta bar s f eta. Right? You always get this uh, combination. That means that any power in the series of uh, this exponential will involve the same number, right? This will be, uh, when I expand the exponential, I'll get terms like that, right? And so if I have a different number of derivatives in eta and eta bar, in this case would be two derivatives in eta and none in eta bar and the other, uh, two derivatives in eta bar and none in eta, and the opposite here, right? I always have leftover etas, 
that in the end will be taken to zero. So these two uh, two point functions are zero trivially when you think in terms of derivatives, right? Uh, so you really need uh, the the situation where you have uh, a bar and a known bar uh, field there, right? And and that's what I'm writing here. Mm -hmm. And now let's let's see what is the action of these guys in here. First, let's write z zero in a convenient way. So uh, let me see if I can keep both on screen. I'm 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 taking it from here, right? So z zero of eta bar eta j is this exponential. I don't need this one because what this one will do is bring down uh, j's, right? Will we'll, we'll provide me with powers of j, but there's no derivatives in j here, right? I'm taking the zero point function in terms of the scalars. So when I take j to zero, I still have this exponential of j phi and this exponential of j delta j, but they will both uh, become one. Right, so I'm not even writing this guy because it won't contribute to this green function. Right, uh, I can keep it here, but it won't do anything. Right, once I try to calculate g two zero, it would contribute to g zero two. Right, and give me the the scalar propagator, and then I have just these derivatives acting. Since I'm at zero order in the generating function, I have the exponential of these guys. Psi bar eta, eta bar psi, plus j phi. And these guys calculate for psi equal to psi bar equal to phi equals zero. All right, so that's z zero right and now ignoring the part uh, since i won't have any other derivatives in in j i can already take j to zero that's equivalent to uh already taking phi to zero here right i can write straight away this exponential also to what order do I need this exponential? Since I have only one derivative in eta bar and one derivative in eta, right? I only really have to take this exponential to first order two, right? Because otherwise I'm just taking more terms that will be zero at the end, right? So I substitute this exponential just by the first uh, order in this product, SF. Del, del psi bar and this will act only on this part because I already take j and, and phi to zero exponential so psi bar eta plus eta bar psi and then these derivatives have it's really easy to act them here because in the case of fermions, because since I have more sources, there's really only one place to act, right? So this guy acts on the right here, so it brings an eta bar, but you had to go over, so there's a sign, so the sign go, goes away, SF, and, and this guy acts here, and I just get eta times this exponential, And this is with this condition. So now that I did the derivatives, I can write just eta bar SF eta, right? Now I substitute this here, right? And do these derivatives, right? Which I'll, I'll, I'll be more careful with the indexes now. So this guy is these two derivatives 
acting on this product, which I'll write very explicitly. So there's two integrals there. Let's call the O4, D4, Z1, D4, Z2, right? Eta bar Z1, SF, Z1, minus Z2, um, eta of Z2. And their, their spinor index is there too, which I'll, I'll baptize delta. This guy is a two uh, index guy, right? The, the, we have already seen that the propagator is a matrix, is a four by four matrix. So delta gamma, and this guy is gamma. Now I have to act with these derivatives. So this derivative, uh, let's let's start with this one. This one has to get all the way over here, right? That means it goes through this guy, which is a Grassmann number. This is not a Grassmann number, but this one is, right? Uh, and matrices I don't have to worry about because I'm writing the indexes explicitly. That's the advantage of having the indexes here. Now I'm talking about the elements of these spinners, so I can I can just move them around. But the Grassmann numbers I have to be careful about. So in order to get here, this sign goes away. And then when it acts here, I get, uh, let me write the integral here. And this function I can put over here, right? But this derivative acting here gives me a delta four of Z2 minus Y and a Kronecker delta of these two spinor indexes, which are beta gamma, right? Now, this other derivative uh, can come over here. Now there's no Grassmann numbers in the middle because this one is already gone. I just differentiate del Dirac delta four of Z1 X and a Kronecker delta of alpha delta. I hope you not confused what is the delta and what's the lower in, uh, spinner index. Hmm? And the sum is implied on these guys, right? They have a sum in delta here and a sum in gamma here for the spinners. So I can use those sums to get rid of this. So gamma becomes beta and delta becomes alpha. <clears throat> Same with uh, direct deltas, right? I can just uh, use this one to integrate in Z2. And I get a Y here. See how the Y is paired with the beta, as I said at the start, right? I can keep that uh, following just one the position and, and, and I'll, I'll know the order of the spinner uh, here. Right? And this guy just kills this integral and give me an X here. Again, X and Y are in the same order uh, in this relation. So it's alpha beta. And this is the two point function for fermions, which is the propagator as it should. So in summary, that's the Feynman rule we can uh, take out of this two-point function, right? Which is this, the, the Feynman rule for the propagator of fermions. We will indicate them like that, right? Notice that now I have an arrow here. And this arrow is there to remind us that there is an ordering. It goes in this case where I label this point Y and this one X, right? The arrow tells me that the propagator is from Y 
2x and that is shown like that here and in this particular order in the exponential right and this is important before in the scalar we could exchange these two guys that would generate a sign here that i could compensate just making p into minus p here right and, and that was fine because i had p square in the denominator now this matrix here uh, it's 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 not uh, symmetric under this exchange so there's a sign here that is important i have to indicate that in my rules right this the, another way you could remember this you, you can see that uh, the arrow is going from the point where i applied psi bar remember this derivative that carry the beta and the y came from a psi bar to psi but we usually don't draw these in the diagrams right uh, uh, what is important is the positions and the direction of the arrow determines the the, the ordering of the space-time coordinates here right? another important thing is that now i also have to expect specify at the points here the the index beta and alpha because remember these are spinor uh, uh, fields right so they have this index that go from one to four which we have discussed before helps me uh, determine uh, the spin state of this this uh, fermium field right so we, i need also to label these points to by some index because the propagator will be a matrix on these indexes and the ordering of the indexes is important this is the alpha beta matrix element not the beta alpha right and that will be important later we'll see i know that uh, up to now it's not very clear how i specify say i have a, a, a fermion which is the particle not the antiparticle and the spin is up in some direction how what the, does that mean uh, uh, in term what does that mean in terms of alpha and beta we'll see but for now it's it's clear that i should have some uh, index carrying this information and that's what alpha and beta do here right so there you go Feynman rule for the propagator of the frame now we have to go and get the Feynman rules for the interaction and that rule comes from the three-point function right I hope by now you can guess that since my interaction is psi bar psi phi right the vertex will be something involving three particles so it will be a vertex with three uh, outgoing lines Right? two of which will be fermions and one there'll be a, uh, will be a scalar and now I'll start indicating scalar by dash lines just to differentiate them from the fermions right and also since I have a psi bar and a psi right uh, I'll, I'll have to have you see looking at this propagator whatever propagator is living will uh, be going out from a psi bar and will be going in a psi since i have a psi and a psi bar here there must be a line going in which will connect to this psi and a, a, a line going out for that psi bar so the vertex will be something like that that just looking at the interaction right the place where i'll get more easily uh, get the rule for that is a three-point function that involves just one vertex right and three external points two fermionic ones so two and one scalar right? so whatever expression i get for that green function is basically just these uh, vertex right with we'll see but this is the simplest object that i can look at if i want to understand that vertex so let's write the expression for this green function right so now i have three derivatives for the external points right which i'll call x y and z right and these derivatives are all different right i have a eta bar that is equivalent to this psi I have a minus the derivative of eta 
which will give me this psi bar. I will put that at point y. Okay. And I have a derivative in j that will give me this scalar field. So what I'm saying is I'm putting three points here, which I'm calling z, y, and x. Right? This, is, this one is y. You see, because there's a line going out. So this is the action of a psi bar at this point, right? And this is what creates the psi bar, so y, okay? and, and, and the opposite here, since there's a line going in, that means there's an action of a psi here, and it, it is this derivative that creates the psi at that point, at point x. Okay? And so these are, are the points. I could also include, right, uh, the um, uh, spinner indexes, right? So I know there's a, some index for this guy, let's call that alpha, and some for this one, beta, right? But that, as I said before, I won't be writing alpha and, and beta explicitly everywhere. I know that beta is associated to y and alpha to x, so at the end I can guess. If you want, you can follow the same calculations explicitly carrying those indexes. I mean, it's, it's something that you can do as, a, as an exercise. Okay? Now, these derivatives are applied to Z1, right? Which I'll write explicitly here. So, there's exponential of del, del psi, scalar, Feynman propagator for fermions, uh, del, del psi bar. There's an exponential of the scalar part, right, which is del, del phi, delta, del, del phi. Okay. And that's applied in the exponential of minus g integral in d4x of psi bar psi phi. This is the interaction, right? And that's what is all that's integrated. And then I have all the sources, psi bar eta plus eta bar psi plus j phi. I'm running out of space on the right side here. And everything is zero at the end, right? So uh, in the end, I have to put all these classical fields uh, to zero, all the sources to zero. After I do all the derivatives, right? Once I, I have differentiated everything, I can set it to zero. Of this interaction, right? I'm only really, um, only really care about the the first order, right? I, I, I'm I'm calculating these things at order g2, the one. Right? So I'll just, just take the first ter term of this exponential. And this I can immediately calculate. I can bring these three derivatives. You see, they don't act here. Right? So I can go straight in here and act on the sources, because that's the only place I have sources. And exchange these three derivatives by fields. So let me write that. I'm keeping those two exponentials right here. Right? I'm going with these derivatives and acting on the sources here, which then immediately after doing that, I can set the sources to zero. So I don't care about the sources anymore. This derivative will give me a phi of z. That's the easy one, right? Uh, these two, I have to be careful with signs, right? So I try to keep the same order they have here. So this one will give me a psi of x. There's an alpha hidden in here, right? And there's a psi bar of y. And there's no sign because this sign is compensated by the fact that I, I am differentiating on the right side here. 
And then there is this exponential, which I'll, I'll get only at first order. D for x. Let's call that a, some, something else. Let me put uh, w here. Because I already have x here. So d for w psi bar w psi w phi of w. And now I just have to set the fields to zero at the end because I already did so for the sources. Right? So far so good. Now I have to do these derivatives acting here. Right? And I again I could just start expanding this exponential, but I, I have to be smart. Right? Uh, I, I can count fields here. Right? Having total four fermionic fields on the right side, two psi bars and two psi's. Right? And I have two scalar fields. Which means uh, I have to take the first order in this exponential, right? The, the, the first order on the argument here. So I have two derivatives to act on the two phi's. And I have to take the square, the, the, the second order in this, in this argument here to get four derivatives, two of which will be in psi bars and two will be on psi's. Everything else is zero, either before, if I take too many derivatives, or after I've set the sources, uh, I mean, not the sources, the classical fields to zero in this case. Right? So if I have two field derivatives, it will be zero when I do this. Right? So I'll take exactly the appropriate amount of derivatives, which means I have for the expansion of this exponential, Oh, let me just reorganize. Let me bring this minus g and the integral in d4w up here to the front. Right? I already know that if I take this to, to um, first order and then I apply this to these two scalar fields, there will be two combinations. Right? I can apply this guy to z and that to w or the other way around. But since the propagator is symmetric, I'll be able to add those two and conceal this factor two here. So I'll just get that part I know, I'm not doing it again, a delta of z uh, w, right? I'm just connecting this point to that one using that derivative. Right? Now I have these two guys, uh, the second order term on these. Right? Remember, this is the expansion of uh, exponential for Grassmann variables, right? These guys are a numbers, right? So you have to be careful with that. The expansion is the one, the, the expansion for the exponential we have shown for Grassmann variables. So this is, there's a half here, minus del, del psi sf, del, del psi bar. And there, these scalar products, uh, are hiding integrals and sums over the spinor indexes here, which I'm not explicitly writing. And there's a second one, which is del, del psi, sf, del, del psi bar. And then I already uh, differentiated on the scalar field. Let me copy just the fermionic ones. I have to be careful not to change the ordering, right? If I want to change the ordering, I have to pay the appropriate amount of signs that come from the reordering. So that's the expression I need uh, to differentiate now. Let me do that carefully once, and then we go slower in the other instances. So let me copy this diagram over here, because we have to keep in mind what we want to calculate when we're doing this derivatives because there are more diagrams still contained here and let's do one uh, the action of one of these parentheses over here right so i'm interested for now in what happens when i do del del psi 
SF del, del Psi bar applied to these guys here. Hmm. And remember, I have some um, some spinner indexes in these guys. Right? I call the one that comes with the X alpha before, right? And I, I, I call the one that comes with the Y a beta. What about these guys? Right? If you go back to the interaction up here, right? This is a part of the Lagrangian, right? And the Lagrangian is not a Grassmann, it's not a spinner, right? It's, it's a number. Right, a complex number. Right. So you, uh, you you cannot have free uh, spinor indexes here. So this interaction means I'm contracting the spinor index of this guy with delta, that one. And I can call them delta. Right? And again, if I have repeated indexes, I have a sum implied. Right? So these guys have the same spinor index. Which means I can associate with that delta with the W and, and do like I did for the alpha and the beta and not write them all the time. But for now, I will write them. Let me put delta and delta here. So the first thing I'll do is just apply this derivative to these guys. right? Just go ahead and apply it. Right? Let me bring the diagram down a little bit. And write that scalar product explicitly. So there's two integrals here. Let's call those integrals um, uh, d for z1, d for z2. Right? Then there's a minus del, del psi z1. And I have an index here, which I'll call you know, psi. Right? This is the spinor index. I have the Feynman propagator, which is Z1 minus Z2, and has uh, two spinor indexes, Psi, Chi, right? And the other derivative is calculated on Z2 and carry this Chi index. But I'll apply it here. Where can this thing act? Here and here. To get to this guy, it has to hop over one other Grassmann number. So there's a minus sign. And to get to this guy, it has to hop over two. So there's a plus sign. That's how the product rule works for Grassmann numbers, right? So let's, let's write it appropriately. So the first term will have a minus sign. And then the derivative acted here. Then put a delta of z2 y right and the rest is just copy these guys just copied over right so i differentiate that guy and now substituting y for z2 and there's also kronecker delta and let's not forget the kronecker delta which is a beta chi right and then there's another term of the product rule, which is this derivative acting here. Now there's a plus sign, right? Because I hopped over two other Grassmann numbers. Let me copy both of them here, right? And I acted here. So that's a delta of Z2 minus W. And a Kronecker delta of delta chi and I copy this guy here and that's the expression I get so far so good and I could continue blindly and apply this uh, uh, derivative everywhere it's possible right there's at least four uh, size on the right side here but I, that would be a wasted effort because I really want only this diagram. And, and, and think about it. Take this delta, right? This delta is enforcing that this propagator here will be from y to some other point, right? One, the z2 will be exchanged by y because of this delta the moment I do this integral, right? And that means that if I apply this derivative, say, to this psi, I'll force z1 to be x, 
and I'll get in the end on, on this particular combination of derivatives a propagator from y to x, right? Something like that, a fermion propagator. Let me do this in the same color here from y to x, or from x to y, in this case is y to x, right? which does not interest me because in the end, uh, I, this diagram will certainly be completed by something like that. Right? That's not the diagram I want to calculate. I don't want the fermion propagators to go from, from x to y. Right? I want them to go from y or, or from external point to internal point. The vertex here is named w. Right? So now, in the first case, instead of taking uh, the product rule for when I apply this derivative here, will give me two terms. I'll take explicitly only the one where I get a propagator going from y to w, right? So I need to apply this derivative here. And the other term I don't care about. I'll just put in uh, implicitly on the calculation. Let me, me show you, right? I can repeat this here, right? Uh, the propagator, let me copy it here, right? Let, let me keep that minus sign here too. Right? There's a minus sign here, I copy it there. And the derivative will act now here, right? So I hopped over one, two Grassmann numbers, no change of sign, right? I can copy this guy here. The delta and the Kronecker deltas are copied down here. This guy goes here. And this becomes a Dirac delta of uh, Z1 minus W. And this becomes a Kronecker delta of Xi, uh, xi delta. Right? That's the first term. For the second term, this one is the opposite, right? I'm already forcing Z2 to be W. So I want Z1 to be one of the external points, right? So I could choose between X and Y, but this is the derivative in Psi, not on Psi bar. So it needs to be X. So I'll act with this derivative on X. Since this is the first, uh, Grassmann number, there's no sign, it acts directly there, right? So I get a delta of z1 minus x times everything, oh, oh, the Kronecker delta of alpha psi. And I just copy the rest, the rest of this thing. And of course, there are extra terms the terms where I connect x to y, and I don't care about them, but I, I, they are here, right? Not saying they are not there, I just don't want to look at them right now. I want to look at this, right? Now I, I need to contract every index here and do the integrals, the integrals using the, the Dirac deltas that I have here. And this is the result, right? If I uh, just use the Dirac deltas, right? In the, the first line, these minus go away with that one, so it's positive. I just exchange Z2 for Y and Z1 for W, right? Here. And of course, the indexes just follow from the Kronecker deltas. But again, I have this association, right? Delta is following W and beta is following Y. Alpha is following X, right? So everywhere I could just forget the indexes. Right? And the second line is the opposite. I exchange x, z1 for x, and z2 for w, which is here. Right? And the, the, the spinor indexes uh, go accordingly, right? Just use the Kronecker deltas. And now I'm, I'll just forget this part completely, right? From now on. I don't care. I just have this diagram. So now let's go back to the uh, two-point function, or the three-point function, actually. It's two uh, fermionic vertexes and one scalar, uh, uh, two fermionic points and one scalar point, right? 
and we will the calculation we just did in yellow is this part so i have to repeat this part here and act it on on the result right so that's the part i just repeated and in here i have this whole result here and these derivatives are acting on all of this hmm? so writing these scalar products explicitly i get this right now i'll go just a little bit quicker i don't have to do the applying these derivatives here will be the same we did before even easier right because now the scalar product is explicit Right? I don't. I, I still have implicitly here the, the um, spinner indexes, right? Everywhere, but there's only one place I can act with this derivative in this term, and only one place I can act with it here, right? Now there's no ambiguity because I already threw this part out, right? So I just do that, and then I do these integrals and uh, follow the spinner indexes, and I get this expression. Right, so this is just repeated. That's the scalar part here. That's the coupling. I have this factor half there from the start, and I got these uh, two different combinations of the fermion propagators, which in, in fact are not different. Right, uh, I have the indexes explicitly here, and this one is already ordered accordingly. Right, these indexes are. Uh, contracted with this one so this is already a matrix product but this is is in the wrong order right if i reorder it right and, and this is just the uh, matrix element so i can just reorder reorder them like that and now it's written in the proper way i could even suppress and say this is the alpha beta uh, element of the, the, the product of these two matrices, right? I won't do that just because I, I don't get a lot of uh, from that, but uh, you see there's a matrix product there, which is the same actually. So I can put these two together and eliminate this factor half and get to the answer we were looking for, G21. 1 is just minus d integral of d for w for this propagator sf x minus w sf w minus y right and there are some hidden indexes here which are put in yellow again alpha delta and delta beta all right let me put a box around this and this is how it looks in terms of the Feynman rules right so i'm i'm writing the full uh, three-point function here indicating all the indexes also the propagator that goes from w to x for instance this one also has indexes in the spinner indexes delta alpha which are at the edges here right same with this one uh, this is the propagator from z to w is a scalar propagator right? but all those things are not part of the the rule of the vertex right these are the rules for the propagators this integral we know every vertex needs need to be integrated over. So really the only part there is intrinsic to the vertex is, is, is this minus G, right? We did everything in position space and Euclidean. So that's the rule you get, right? You could also have done that in Minkowski and then you, you have an extra I there, but that's all, right? You have to carefully do, follow all the signs, but that's the result, right? So essentially now we have uh, the Feynman rules for for uh, the Yukawa interaction in position space. There's one more detail that we need to look at before we we consider the Yukawa uh, Feynman rules uh, done in position space, and that's something intrinsic to fermions that didn't show up 
in bosonic fields. Uh, so consider, just for a moment, a loop of fermions. Suppose I draw a diagram that looks like this. That's just a closed line of uh, fermions. And uh, in, in Yukawa, we know that the basic interaction looks like this, right? With a scalar here. Okay? So what I have to do to actually complete this loop is put a bunch of points here. And in each of those points, I have already two fermionic lines, one going in and one going out of the point. Right? But I also have to put a scalar. Right? So I have, for each of these points, a scalar line going out. And suppose we have, now for generality, a total of capital N lines going out. That also means I have capital N vertices, right? They are all there. In each, between every two of those uh, vertices, right, I have a propagator, a fermion propagator, right? So let's uh, name those, these, these, these vertex Z1 alpha 1 and name this one Z2 alpha 2 then I know that this propagator is the Feynman propagator, right? From Z2 to Z1, right? And in terms of the spin or indexes, he had, this propagator has alpha 1, alpha 2 index, right? And we know that from the, the um, or, uh, generating functional, Right? This guy is generated by the action of one combination of derivatives that looks like this, right? There's a scalar product here, a del, del psi bar here, acting on something that looks like psi of alpha 1, z1, right? And a psi bar of alpha 2, z2. So that the lines go from 2 to 1, Right? And, and these derivatives will act here and fix the edge points of this propagator in the way you see here. So far, so good. Right? That's how we, we obtain these propagators. So the first thing to notice right, is that if I have this closed line of propagators, what will happen? Let's start with this guy. Right? Suppose I, I start with this propagator. Let me change the color. Right? The next one, right, or the one before that, let's say this one, will come from Z3 alpha 3 and go to Z2 alpha 2. Right? So I'll have a term that is coming from Z3 to Z2 and has indexes alpha 3, alpha 2, alpha 3. Right? So that's the next propagator. And I go all the way around. Until in the end, right? I'm going the dire opposite direction of the arrow here, but I could do it either way. When I get here, this is point uh, capital N, right? So this point here is coordinate Z capital N, alpha capital N. That means that the last propagator in this direction will be the propagator that goes from Z1 to Z capital N with indexes alpha capital N, alpha 1. Right? Now notice that at every point I have a product of matrices because matrices because this is contracted with this. Alpha 3 will be contracted with the one that goes from alpha 4 to alpha 3, right? And so on and so forth, all the way to alpha N. And then alpha 1 is contracted back to the alpha 1 here. We know what that is. Right? And that's a trace. So what you get, always get, when you have loops of these uh, fermions is a trace of this product of propagators. So that's the first important thing. We don't even call this 
a different uh, Feynman rule because that's already in the propagators themselves, right? You just have to, to use the Feynman rule for the, um, the propagator and the indexes will come out and you just have to look at them and, and see that you, you get a trace. Sometimes it's hard to select what you want. So that's, that, that's the first thing. Loops of fermions will generate uh, traces, right? But there's more to it. There's more to it. Because remember, these derivatives uh, will be acting on the interacting part of the Lagrangian. Remember, these are all vertices. So they are coming from the interaction. And what I have in the, uh, what I have in the interaction is G, Psi bar Psi, not Psi Psi bar. See, now I, here I have Psi Psi bar, here I have Psi bar Psi. And this is acting, there's a Phi too in the interaction, but not, neither the G nor, nor the Phi matter. And these guys will be acting at some Z, say, st let's talk about Z1, for instance. They'll be acting on Z1, both of them. And both of them will have the same alpha, right? Because this is contracted in the interaction, right? Remember, the interaction is in the Lagrangian, and the Lagrangian is a number, not a spinner. So the spinner index is need to be contracted, right? Let me name these just for short, like that. Psi by Psi 1. That means I'm calculating it. Z1 with index alpha 1, right? I'll have n times this, and the derivatives will be acting on that. Let me write that, right? So what I'm looking at is a bunch of derivatives of this sort. The bar is here, not there, right? Acting on a product of psi bar psi. Psi bar psi, one, psi bar psi, two, all the way to psi bar psi n, right? And of course, there are many things that can happen here. If I contract, uh, when, when I apply these derivatives, I get many diagrams, even ones that are not loops, right? But, but the, the one that gives me the loop up there is the one where if I act with this guy on psi, right, I will, I'll act with the other guy on psi bar because that is the combination that will give me the propagator from Z2 to Z1, right? Leaves from psi bar and goes to psi, right? And then the combination that will give me the propagator from psi bar 3 to psi will be this one, which is all fine, except that notice, what I have here is a product of psi bar, psi, psi bar, psi, but I want to contract psi, psi bar. That means that I can either do a very complicated thing with the derivatives and follow all the signs, or I can just take this last guy and bring all the way to the front here and re rewrite this as psi n z n times all these things all the way to psi bar psi n minus 1 and then I have psi bar z n alpha n right? and then I have to decide if I have a plus or a minus sign in front that I have to pay for doing this bunch of commutations. Right? I can ignore all those guys because they always come in pairs, so I never get a sign from them. But that psi had to go over this psi bar, so there's a minus sign. Once I do that, I can just apply the derivatives in the way they are written. Right? Very easy now to apply them the way they're written. Of course, this del del psi bar has to go over this guy to get here, but that compensates this sign, and then this acts here. So I can then act them on order and get that loop 
I wrote upstairs. That tells me there will be a total minus sign appearing here. Right? There's no way uh, I can avoid this minus sign when I try to act with these derivatives on this fermion. Right? That means uh, that besides when I have a loop like that, besides having to multiply that diagram for minus d to the n, which is the number of vertices, I also have a new Feynman rule. That, that is, when I, have, when I see loops of fermions, each fermion loop um, generates a sign, a minus sign. In fact, if you want to compare with a bosonic theory, you could take the lambda phi 3 theory. If you take the lambda phi 3 theory, the only vertex you have is this one, and you can make a loop like that from bosons, right? And see what happens, and there won't be a minus sign because there's no reason to, okay? So with that additional rule for fermions, let me make a table with all the position space Feynman rules for uh, Yukawa interactions. So this is what I wanted to discuss today, right? This is a summary of what we got. We got a propagator for fermions. This is the propagator of four scalars that you need to do Yukawa interactions. This is the, the rule for the vertex. And we have this new one, which, me, which uh, tells me that for every loop, you could have more than one fermionic loop in your calculation. For every one of those loops, I have to multiply the whole expression by minus one. Right? So these are the new Feynman rules. Of course, you still have the other ones, right? This is just, uh, um, for now, the Feynman rules to get the green functions in position space and in Euclidean position space. So you still have the rule that you have to integrate over every vertex position, you still have to look for symmetry factors, but besides those, you have these new rules, right? So next video, we'll go into momentum space and look at the asymptotic states for fermions, which will bring us uh, new, new things as compared to the scalar ones. See you then.